just participate in the process, all right? Can we do that? So I just want to encourage you to do that. Well, we want to again welcome everyone who's joining us from home. We're continuing in our series on the book of Acts. We were going to call it the summer series, but we know that's not going to happen, right? Or we'd have to really pick it up. (laughs) We'd have to pick up our pace a little bit. But we're going to be going through the entire book, however long it takes us. And last week, you know, we began, well, we've been like, a month on the first three verses, and then last week we began to look at the title of the message was the pre-mission briefing of the disciples, and Acts 1.8 was the mission that this gospel kingdom message is going to be taken to the uttermost parts of the world, to the ends of the earth, right? That is the mission, and the disciples were being briefed for this mission. It's our mission, too, to go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. What a great week it was last week as we looked at the disciples. Uh, They were on the Mount of Olives and Jesus had ascended and they were staring up into the heavens as you would have been too. And two men and white coats came. And now today we think that would mean they're coming to take you away, right? But no, these were angels, weren't they? They were dressed in white robes and they stood beside them and they spoke to them. These words will be on the screen. Verse 11, do you remember it? And they said to them, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven, he's going to come back again in the same way you saw him go into heaven. How many would like to have been there for that? I would have liked to participate in that and seeing that. And I've often wondered what it would be like if that really happened today. And last week, Eric sent me this picture of what it, what it might have looked like if Jesus would have ascended today. Why, well, we would even have our phones out, wouldn't we? Yeah, yeah. Well, that event, that's Eric's family. And we, it's hard to believe, but this Tuesday will be a year since Gwen passed away. And this was an important moment when balloons were being released. And they stood there and watched them as they couldn't see. Have you ever done that where you released a balloon, you watch it until you can't see it anymore? Yeah. We say, was that what it was like? No. No, actually, Jesus didn't go that far. A cloud just took him. And as you have to listen to the message last week, but I believe that Jesus just entered another dimension. And the heaven's closer than you think. And he didn't go very far until they couldn't see him anymore. But maybe it, it would have looked something like that. And, and I thought, too, as the disciples had that experience, and they were trying, can you imagine, they were trying to get their composure, right, after this event. I mean, would, just, would this have been like any other day? This, this, would have, this would have been incredible. I mean, Jesus has ascended. We got angels talking to us. And all these teachings that Jesus did, it was like sensory overload, all right? Their hearts are beating fast and and their minds are racing. What are they going to be thinking about? I think their first thought would have been, now what? What are we going to do now? And I wonder if maybe they would have went back to Jesus' very last command that he spoke to them at that moment. Do you remember what it was? Verse 4. It's on the screen. While he was eating with them, he gave them this command. It would be the last one. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait. Wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. He's telling them that they need to wait and, and stay focused. All right. That's the last command. And I think probably their mind went to that. I don't know about you, but are you, how, good are you, how good are you at waiting? Uh, is it easy for you? Are you a good waiter or not so much? I love this picture of this dog because it almost fits what the angel said. Can you imagine this dog? His master went out that door in the morning and he knows he's coming back through that same door in the evening. Does that fit? Yeah. And that dog is waiting with expectation. How many of you know waiting is not just passive all the time, but it's an expectation of waiting. And, and for some of us, we're good at it. Others, not so good. How, how many of you, when you go to the grocery store, you survey the checkout lines 
and you have to make a choice which one you're going to use, right? Which one do you pick usually? I'm going to pick the one with the shortest line. Are you going to do that too? Yeah. I'm not going to get in that line with all them people. I'm going to get in the short line. Have you ever had that experience and you, and you got in that short line and pretty soon it stalled out? And that big line that you didn't want to get into, it's moving, clicking. Pretty soon, and I always say, I always mark that person. Let's see, that was the last person. I marked that person, and I'm still standing here, and they're going out the door. They're, I'm thinking, man, are you, does that frustrate you a little bit? We don't like to wait, do we? How about when you go to a restaurant? Come on, tell me the truth. And you get there, and, and it's, there's a wait, right? And they'll tell you how much time. If they say, it'll be 10 minutes, I go, no problem. We can wait 10 minutes, can't we, honey? Yeah. Oh, 20 minutes. I can even do that. 30 minutes? If the food's really good, I might be able to wait 30 minutes, right? We can go, especially if they give you a pager and you can leave and come back. That's good, right? But what if they say, sorry, it's going to be an hour. Is, are you going to wait? Are you going to do what we sometimes do? Let's go find another place. And it's an hour wait there too. And so we end up going back and we don't save any time. We're just not very good at, at waiting, are we? Well, the scripture we're going to be looking at today, it's, I, 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 call it, I call it the in-between time. That's where the disciples are right now. They're in the, the in-between time. They have the ascension and a promise, but they don't have the fulfillment yet. That's the in-between time. That's the waiting time. That's where, that's where we end up. The, there's the promise, but not the fulfillment yet. Have you ever been in an in-between time? Have you ever, can you relate to this? That time of waiting. I know some of you have been waiting on test results. You have an expectation, but it's in between, and we don't know the answer yet. How many of you are waiting for your prodigal child to come back to the Lord? Are you? I saw some hands go up there, yeah? You've been waiting. It's the in-between time. I know my mom, she said the more she prayed, the worse things got. And I remember doing a wedding once, and she was sitting in the front row crying. And I said, Mom, do you always cry at weddings? No. But I was just sitting here thinking, if only I would have known how things were going to turn out, it would have been so much easier. <laughs> but that's not how it works, because see, she had to go and live in the in-between time. That time of waiting when she prayed, but it didn't look like much was happening. Or maybe there's something you're believing for right now. You could just fill in the blank. But you're in the in-between time, and you're waiting. I want you to take out your insert this morning. And this is my sermon title, Four Ways to Wait Well. And we're going to watch the disciples navigate in their in-between time. And they're, they're leaving the Mount of Olives. They've just had this overload experience. And, and, and they're, they're starting to head back into the city. And we're going to pick up right where we left off last week. Are you ready? Verse 12. It's on the screen. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called Mount of Olives a Sabbath day's walk from the city. How far away were they? That's less than a mile. Less than a mile. Wasn't that long old walk? I would have liked to have been there to hear their conversation because they were getting ready to walk. They were getting ready to walk into the in-between time. The promise hadn't come yet. They had it, but it hadn't been fulfilled. And now God was calling them into a time of waiting. And the Lord's going to teach them how to wait because wait has a purpose in our life. Jesus does things with waiting. And here's the first way to wait well that they did. They did what Jesus said. They, did, they took that last command. And they said, well, let's just do what Jesus said. Let's just obey him. Made me think of a, my wife and I were in Rome, Italy many years ago with Terry Hoggard, a missionary there. And, and he pastored the, the American church, the uh, not the, the international church, full of all different nationalities. And one of the, the couples that attended that church was a United States Army colonel from the NATO War College. And we went to their home for lunch. He was in charge of the prisoners of war in Kuwait. So I was very interested to hear his perspective. And during the conversation, he's a spirit-filled believer, just loved the Lord with all his heart. He, he, he talked about three rules of battle. 
and you can just write these in your other notes if you want, and you might remember them. But he said, the first rule of battle is you're not, you're not defeated till the last man surrenders. All right? Good word, good word. Like that. The second one, which is where we're going to find the disciples today, he said, don't let the enemy flank you and pull you off mission. Stay focused on your last orders. And unless they change, stay on mission. For the enemy will try to draw you off mission. Stay on mission. And that's what the disciples are doing right now. That was the last command we got. So that's what we're going to do, right? What was his third rule of battle? He said we failed to do it in the quake conflict. He said when you have the enemy on the run, chase them. What do we do? We have a little victory in our life. What do we do? We pull back, don't we? Hey, bless God. Keep going. Don't stop, he said. Finish the job. So those are your three, those, that's extra today. But here are the disciples. They're just doing what Jesus said. And when you're in an in-between time, faith obedience is a way to wait. Well, how important is it? Well, there's some scriptures listed on the screen. You can write them down. I'm going to read them to you. Fascinating scriptures. What Jesus said about this in Luke 8, 19 through 21. Then Jesus' mothers and brothers came to see him, but they couldn't get to him because of the crowd. Someone told Jesus, your mother and your brothers are standing outside. They want to see you. I don't know about you, but I'd think they'd get a VIP pass, wouldn't you? I mean, if your mother was outside, wouldn't you go, hey, clear the crowd here. Let, let, let them in, let them in. Listen to what Jesus says. Jesus replied, my mother and my brothers are all those who hear God's word and obey it. Whoa. Later in Luke, in Luke 11, Jesus encounters a woman in the crowd. He's speaking, and this woman cries out. Very unnerving for a speaker, right? Somebody cries out. says, as he was speaking, a woman in the crowd called out, God bless your mother, the womb from which you came, the breasts that nursed you. How many of you know the crowd's going, oh, oh, that's sweet, that's so nice? Jesus replied, but even more blessed, are all who hear the word of God and put it into practice. What's Jesus doing? He's elevating obedience above everything. He's, he's, he's putting it high. He's putting it in a, in a high place how important this is. And in 1 John 2, 3 through 5 from the NIV, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands, this is hard, He's a liar. Mm. I'd rather say he's mistaken. My mama said you're not supposed to use that word. Must be important. He says, and the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Love, faith, obedience. That's the progression. We don't, love, we don't obey out of duty. We obey out of delight, right? Because we love him. If you love me, you keep my commandments. He's saying that the love of God is complete in you through the act of obedience. When you're in an in-between place, a time of waiting, that's the time to commit ourselves to obedience. I just asked you a question this morning. You can answer it privately. What in your life right now, where in your life is disobedience? If Jesus is elevating obedience to such a high place, we may, especially if we're in a waiting time, especially if we're in an in-between time, that's a time to say, okay, Lord, I want to be obedient to what you have spoken. And you make that, Lord, I'm going to obey you. With your help, I'm going to do it if you'll help me. Let's keep reading. How about verses 13 through 14? And when they had arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present, here's the 11, were Peter, John, James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James. Keep reading verse 14. They all joined together, some of your translations will say, with one accord. And they were constantly in prayer, along with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. This is the last time Mary will be mentioned in the New Testament. But isn't it unique that she's there with the believers? 
She is a believer. His brothers are believers. Now, you've got to remember, it wasn't long ago, his brothers thought he was crazy. Remember, they went and tried to rescue him. The poor guy, he's lost his mind. Something happened. It is the resurrection. The resurrection is what changed them. So what do you see in these scriptures? When you're in a time of waiting, one way to wait well, do you see it? Number two, they gathered together. They gathered together in a spirit of unity. I believe that when we're in waiting times and when we're in these in-between times, the worst thing you can do is isolate yourself. And God's wanting them to experience this. This is the first church service, really. Yeah, even before Acts 2. This is when they first got the, they first gathered together. And why was it important? Why didn't he just say, go hide in a rock, behind a rock somewhere and just uh, find a cave, find, find a... No, get to, go to Jerusalem, wait there. He knew they would gather together. And we're going to hear later, it's about 120 people. But here's why it's important. I'm going to read these scriptures. You can write them down. Hebrews 10, 24 through 25. Let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Why do we gather? Why do we gather? Why is it important? Why is it significant? Because when we come together, there is, a, there is an effect we have upon one another. We stir up one another for love and good works. And he's suggesting to us it needs to be a habit. There's, there's, this is a good meeting together. Is meeting together important to you? If we learned anything over the last couple of years, we learned to value gathering together. Now, here in our country, we got options, all right? You need to travel overseas a little bit. I'm telling you, people are so passionate about gathering. They'll walk half a day to get to church, and they won't, they'll stay. They'll stay. They will milk it for all it's worth because there's such value when we come together. Have we lost that value? Do the planets have to be lined up just right for us to gather? Or is it something that we hunger after? They realize in this in-between time, this was important. In Colossians 3.16, let the message of Christ dwell among you. See, it's a group gathering. Let it dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. Is this what we read about earlier in the service? With psalms, hymns, songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Now, you can have a, 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 a solitude experience of worship, but it, it, there's something about worshiping together, isn't there? Am I the only one that enjoys it? Is it, hey, we may not have the best, we, we probably don't have a 15-piece orchestra. Or something. Do you need that? No. no. It's from the heart, isn't it? And I love I loved to worship by myself. I was worshiping in my bathroom this morning. I put my recorder on. I'm worshiping. But, and it was great, and I loved it. But it was all a prerequisite to come in here and being able to worship with you. He says we need to teach and admonish one another. Do you know how many one another's there are in the New Testament? 27. Go look for them when it says, and do this with one another. 27, you can't do this unless you come together. That's how important it is. 27 one another's, it's God's plan. And when we gather, listen to this, Galatians 3.28. When we gather, there is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female. You are all one in Jesus Christ. This is mind-blowing. Not to you. Because you're, oh, yeah, we do that. Yeah, we know that. No, in that day and age, this was revolutionary. To bring Jews and Greeks together. To bring slave and free together. Male and female. You, no, 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 there's got to be separation there. He says, you are all one in Christ. This is a new dynamic. And it's not just the gathering, but they're going to be in one accord. Wow. They're going to be united. This is the work of the Spirit. Ephesians 4, 1 through 6. Man, you need to meditate on this this week sometime. Just put this in your lap. This, this is from the Lord. Therefore, Paul said, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, I beg you, I beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Always, this is what he said, if this is true, then you will, I wish he didn't use the word always, but always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other making allowances for each other's faults because of your love. Is that hard for you? Make every effort to keep yourself united in the Spirit, binding yourself together with peace. 
And then he gives seven ones, seven of them. Here they are. For there's one body, one spirit, just as you've been called to one hope. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, in all, and living through you all. He's saying the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace is what holds us together. Now you've got to understand something. Because later on in Ephesians, in the same chapter, he'll talk about endeavoring to reach for the unity of the faith. Is that the same thing? No. And this is where we get confused. We have all these denominations, right? Doesn't look like we're very unified, does it? Listen, the unity of the Spirit is totally based, one Lord, one baptism. It is your salvation. We all come the same way. There's only one way. It's, it's, it's faith plus nothing, right? It's God's grace plus nothing. We come. That's how we come. And that's the unity of the Spirit. He said, keep it. Keep it. Why? Because you can lose it. I see it all the time. We, when you first got saved, remember? Man, you just loved every Christian, didn't you? Yeah, oh, glory to God. You a believer? I'm a believer too. Glory to God. Till we learn that, there's different kinds, you know. Then we get into the unity of faith. And if you read it, it says unity of the faith, which is based in knowledge. Are we all different places in the unity of faith? Sure. Here in this church we are. Read the New Testament. It was always an issue. There were issues they were debating, discussing. But it is the unity of the spirit that brings us together in the bond of peace. I mean, who was in the 120? Who gathered there? Boy, listen, this unity, it's not based in sameness. It's based in diversity. The world is not impressed by unity of sameness. They have that. That's what denominations are all about. We all get together because we're the same. All right, we group together, businesses, all the same. We want to be the same. But this is something different. And he's pointing it out. This group, and he gives us this list, this group is in one accord, but they are diversified. They're, we're talking about unity and diversity. That will catch the world's attention. Not sameness, they get that. But when people come together of all walks and lives and they become one, all different colors, all different economic status. All, that's what he says. Who was in the room? Well, let's just think for a minute. Were there tax collectors there? How many of you think, I don't know, how many of you think Zacchaeus was there? There's 120. Subtract 11. Subtract Mary, the mother of Jesus, brothers. You still got a lot of people up. Who were they? They were a mixed group. Tax collectors. There were fishermen there. There were moms there. Is that right? Wasn't there moms there? There were moms there. Yeah. I love the picture we have there. There's a lady with a child sitting on her lap. I wonder. I wonder. Hmm. The mother of Jesus was there. She was believing. Jesus' brothers. How about some ex-prostitutes? Were they there? They were. We know about them. You know they were in the room, don't you? Carpenters. Well, it even says there were zealots there. What's a zealot? Zealots hated Rome. They hated them. I mean, these are the guys you'd meet you in the alley and they'd take care of you, all right? They hated Rome. Wait a minute. Matthew works for Rome. I wonder how they got along in the gathering. He works for Rome, and you hate Romans. Oh, no, what are we going to do now? There were Jews. There were Gentiles. There were slaves. There were free. This was a motley crew of messed up people, and they all came together just like us this morning, right? And what were they focused on? What is it that united them? Not sameness. In their diversity, it was Jesus himself. Now, notice our third Way to wait well comes out of this text, so we'll just put it up there right now. Here it is. They didn't just meet together. They prayed together. They prayed together. When you're in an in-between place, I'll tell you, prayer becomes important, especially corporate prayer. Now, from where I sit, just an observation. I don't mean it in a negative way. But why is it so hard for people to gather together and pray? It's difficult for us, isn't it? In fact, you want to thin out a crowd? Call it a prayer meeting. Yeah you'll reduce your numbers drastically. Why? Why? Well, I'm kind of nervous praying. I, I'm, you know, I, I'm uncomfortable. 
praying with others. I believe when you come to this in-between place, all that will be set aside. You'll be drawn to corporate prayer. God's wanting to increase your prayer. How many of you need to pray more? We'd all raise our hands, would we? How many think prayer is important? We'd all raise our hands. Then why don't we do it more? (laughs) God is using the waiting time to draw us to a place of prayer. Now, there's two ways you can pray. There's solitude, and I put in there, solitude is not isolation. I believe there are times when God will set you apart. In fact, we'll see it right here, Matthew 6, 6. This is about prayer. This is what he said. When you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray to your father in private. And your father who sees everything and sees in secret, he will reward you. Okay, that's solitude, isn't it? Is that a good thing? Okay, now you got to put, ten- all truth has tension. Remember that. I don't care what you're talking about. All truth has tension. Whenever you're looking at the truth, say, where's the tension? Where's the tension? So does this mean every time we pray, that's what we do? That's the only way you pray? No. In fact, in Matthew 18, just keep reading. He says, I also tell you this. If two of you agree here on earth concerning anything you ask, my Father in heaven will do it for you. For where two or three are gathered together as my followers, I am there among them. All right? We're out of the closet, aren't we? This, this makes coming out of the closet a whole new thing, doesn't it? we got to come out of the closet. Hey, but you better spend some time in the closet. You need to do both. You need to have that solitude. But never let solitude become isolation. We are not meant to be alone. And the enemy is so clever. I see him. I see him working people all the time, trying to isolate them. Separate yourself from the body. Don't be involved. See, this, I know he understands. We need a... Gathering is important, and when we gather, we learn to pray together. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Always be joyful, check. Oh, here's the second one. Never stop praying. Pray always, it says. Well, how do you do that? Is that really possible? I mean, wouldn't you be weird if you were just praying all the time? I think prayer is not what you do. It's who you are. It's being connected. To God. He's ever living to make intercession for me, so I'm connected to him on that level, and I'm praying. Prayer is a first response for me. Well, I, have you ever heard this phrase? All we can do now is pray. Like, I guess we've exhausted everything. All that's left is prayer. Wrong attitude, isn't it? No, we pray first. We take this to the and we pray with each other. The re- now, the rest of the chapter, it's a target-rich environment, okay? And there's a lot of scriptures. So I'm going I'm to put our waiting well principle up first on the screen because I want you to be thinking about it while we read through these scriptures. I want you to think about this whole idea of godly decision making, making godly decisions. We're going to see that in this in-between time. When we are waiting, there will be times when we need to make decisions. And the disciples are about to model for us what that might even look like. When we are in a waiting time, we need to be sure that we're making godly decisions. I call it sanctified wisdom. There are times, is it true, when it's not black and white. There are times, you know, I mean, it's easy to say, uh, let's see, should I go rob a bank? Let me pray about that. No, God says I shouldn't. No, I don't need to pray about that. Should I be unfaithful to my wife? Well, I'll just say that. No, no. Those are easy decisions to make. But are there decisions that are not cut and dry? And we find ourselves having choices to make. What do we do? Well, we're going to learn from this text, and we're going to read it and just comment as we go. And then I'm going to leave you with four questions that are going to be very important. All right, so let's pick up our text in verse 15. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120. And he said, brothers and sisters, The scriptures have to be fulfilled in which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through David concerning Judas, who served as a guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number and shared in our ministry. I wonder if that last sentence was said with a little brokenness. Judas, he shared in our ministry with us. He was part of us. We broke bread together. But he he stands up and he declares... By the way, who made Peter in charge? Did he just arbitrarily stand up? He's fulfilling what Jesus said. Satan, remember? Remember? He said, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat, but I'm, I've prayed for you, and when you return, you will strengthen the brethren. That's what Peter's doing. Peter's fulfilling. This is what Jesus prayed. Peter, the guy who failed, 
Why is he the leader? He should, isn't there some more faithful guys? No. God's using him in this role. And it'll be interesting as we go through Acts. Peter's going to kind of fade a little bit. Who's going to come out center stage? Paul. But that's going to be 15 years from now. So now Peter, he stands. He takes the lead. And what does he do? He goes to Scripture, doesn't he? That's what we need to do when we're in an in-between time. We need to go through Scripture, and we need to be honest about what's happened in our life. Don't sweep the ugly stuff under the rug. Let's be real about it. All right? Keep reading. Verse 18. With the payment he received for his wickedness, Judas bought a field. There he fell headlong. His body burst open, and all his intestines spilled out. Everyone in Jerusalem heard about this, and so they called that field in their language, Akadama, that is, field of blood. I thought you said scripture was boring. I mean, that's the kind of stuff, if you were watching a movie, you'd cover your kid's eyes. Don't look at this, right? This is kind of like, whoa, is it really necessary to tell us the gory details of this? I think Peter wanted them to know the severity of the moment. He wanted them to know how horrible this was. Maybe they already knew about it. He said everybody knew about it. He just wanted to remind them. He wasn't sweeping it under the rug. Verse 18. For said Peter, it is written in the book of Psalms, may his place be deserted. Let there be no one to dwell in it. And may another take his place of leadership. Where do you get that? Oh, this is interesting. This is the first time Peter ever quotes scripture. He's never quoted scripture up to this point. They didn't have the New Testament. All they have is the Old Testament. So he goes to Psalm 69 and Psalms 109. David wrote, and he's saying that through the Holy Spirit, I, as I read the Psalms, I think David was describing he had experienced betrayal in his own life. And this was an actual reflection of it. And Peter, I think by the power of the Holy Spirit, is capturing that and bringing it forward to this little gathering of 120 people. And he said, this is exactly what's happening here. The same spirit, the same spirit. And he's keen on that another is going to take his place in leadership. Read verse 21. Therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time. The, Lord, the whole time the Lord Jesus was living among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness for us of his resurrection. So, where do you get that? I think this is sanctified wisdom. He's saying, look, we need to replace Judas. All right, who should replace him? A new guy? No, we want somebody who's been with us from the beginning. Somebody from, John, from the baptism of John. All the way up to, who is it among us? Who is it among us? You say, well, why is it necessary? Why not just, can't we go with 11? Is 12 really going to make the difference? Why 12? And later on, later on, who's the first disciple to give his life? In Acts, you're going to read it. James, with a sword. They run him through. They didn't replace him. Why are they replacing Judas? My opinion. I think the way Judas fell in wickedness is not the same as the other apostles who gave their lives in faith. I think it's totally different. I also think there may be a mystery attached to this that we don't understand. Later, Paul refers to himself as an apostle. He says, I was born out of time. I'm the least, he said. I'm the least. But so the apostolic ministry is going to continue on. We'll see it in Ephesians. You know, that means to send forth, to send out. But the original 12, that's something special. Consider this, not on the screen. Revelations 21, 14. John is seeing heaven. This is what he described. The wall of the city had 12 foundation stones, and on them were written the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So whose name's going to be on there? Judas' name going to be on there? Oh, maybe it's the new guy. It's be, but there's 12. It's a great mystery to me. So I think he had to be replaced. So that scripture could be fulfilled. You want to keep reading? This is cool. 
this is the in-between time. It gets a little strange here. So they nominated two men. Joseph called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. And then they prayed. What? They prayed again. They prayed again. Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry, which Judas left to go where he belongs. Wow. I don't know about you, but I'd go for the guy with the short name, wouldn't you? Be easier to remember. Only problem is his name's Joseph, so I'd probably be a little leaning towards Joseph. Yeah, that's a good name, right? Evidently, they were both okay, and they both fulfilled the qualifications. So what do we do? Flip a coin? How do we know? Either one. Have you ever been in that situation where you had good choices to make, but you didn't know which one to make? And then they do something weird that's never done again in the New Testament. <laughs> Listen to this. Verse 26. Then they cast lots, and the lot fell to Matthias. So he was added to the 11 apostles. They got out their Yahtzee game. And they rolled the dice. What? Is that any way to do things? Answer me a question. Have you ever laid a fleece before the Lord? Is it similar? They knew this scripture, Proverbs 16, 33. The lot is cast into the lap and, is every de- and, and it's every decision is from the Lord. Hmm. So should we do that? Let's cast lots from now on if we have an important decision to make. No. The Holy Spirit's coming. It's going to be different, right? But I can tell you this. I think casting lots would be better than what some of you do. Some of you just re- rely on your emotions. Casting lots would be better. Some of you just depend on your circumstances. Casting lots might be better. Don't be hard on the disciples. I've done it too. I've laid fleeces before the Lord when I wasn't sure. It's how I came here. I was in business, so you know the story, right? And, uh, okay, should I pastor Faith Community Church? Well, Kendra knows she was there. And we're, well, the only thing is, if, if I give up my business, then Kendra and and Liz, the ladies I love so much, who've given so much to me, what happens in insurance? Kinder knows. They take an agency and they dice it up in little pieces and spread it out to other people. I didn't want that to happen, but that's how that was expected. And, and then they would have to find another job. And No, Lord, that doesn't feel right to me. And so I laid a fleece before the Lord. I said, Lord, if you want me to do this, then the agency will stay intact and staff will keep their jobs. So... I met a Christian agent. We put together a business plan. We thought we had done a great job. And we went to a meeting. We had a conference call with the corporate office in California. And uh, they, we heard them. They were in this little box. And we were laying out our plan. And I'm going, yes, this is great. And they said, no. And they had reasons why. The agent next to me, I looked over and tears in his eyes. We worked hard on that. And I said, well, Lord, I guess you've spoken I'm not supposed to do this. We all left the office as I was leaving. Our district manager said, Joe, would you stay behind and sit down a minute? I want to talk to you. I said, okay. She says, I know this is going to sound weird, but I don't want to be a district manager anymore. I want to be an agent again, which is kind of backwards. I said, really? Yeah. Would you consider me taking the agency? Uh, And we'll keep the agency intact. And we'll keep keep the staff. We'll, We'll even give them a raise. I don't know if that happened. You need to go check your pay tub, see if that happened or not. And she said, but then she said, oh, only one problem. Yeah, what's that? Your agency's not big enough. I need your office partner's agency too. I said, no way. It isn't going to happen. He's a young man, got three kids. He's not going to do it. I, I'm older. It's not a big deal. Ask him. I said, okay. So I called him on the phone. Hey, meet me at Starbucks. Got something to talk to you about. Be right there. I said, man, thanks for showing up. He said, well, I thought I'd better because you've never invited me to coffee at Starbucks on my day off, so something's up. I said, well, that's true. I said, here's the deal. And I laid it out, and I couldn't believe it. He said, I would love to do that. I said, you would? Yeah. I wanted to do it a year ago. My uncle had a franchise business, but I I told him I couldn't do it because I didn't want to hurt you, Joe. Oh, really? Yeah. And Like that, it happened. 
Now, why could you say, Joe, you're not very spiritual. You should have just asked God what to do. Sorry. <laughs> I, I laid a fleece before. Have you ever done it? Is it okay to do it? I think God understands it. I think he understands it. I want to give you four questions and one encouragement as you leave. You write these on the back side of your notes. When you're in a situation where you, you, you're not sure what to do and there's not a clear direction, here's four questions. First one, ask this question. How will this affect my gospel mission? You got a new job opportunity? Cool. How will it affect your gospel mission? Hey, more pay. It must be right. Really? It's not one of the questions. The question is, how will it affect your mission? Oh, I know. We got an opportunity. I can see Connie. Connie, we got an opportunity to go to Miami Beach. Yeah, we got a home right on the beach. That'd be cool. Yeah. She'd say, well, only if the kids could come with us, right? Probably because grandkids are everything. You know that, right? Oh, man, nothing. Yeah, well, well, that sounds good. Maybe. How does it affect gospel mission? Isn't that it? Hmm. Hey, should I marry this person? Well, let me look. Where's the scripture? What, what, what? I don't see it anywhere. Oh, there's some principles. Where should I go to school? <clears throat> Here's a second question. Does this decision violate scripture? May, there may not be some clear scripture, but is there principles that are being violated? We talked about that earlier. You know, some things I don't need to pray about. But is, will, will this enhance what the scriptures declare. And that's what Peter did. He went right to the scripture. First time he ever did it, where we saw it in scriptures, that was kind of, he thought it was so important, he needed to find a scriptural basis for it. You need to do the same. If something obviously violates scripture, be careful. And three, have I sought godly counsel? And I'm not talking about shopping for counsel. You know how that works, don't you? I'm going to keep going until I find somebody who agrees with me. Yeah. Well, that guy doesn't agree with me. I'm going to go to the next guy, next guy. And go to somebody who loves you and you trust, and you know they'll speak the truth. And if you know for some reason you shouldn't go to them, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm, problem. I know what they're going to say. Oh, really? And fourth, how much time have I spent in prayer concerning this issue? I mean, seriously. Not that, well, I guess all I do is pray. Now, I'm talking about have you saturated in prayer? Have you put yourself in a position to hear God's voice? And have you asked other people to pray with you? And if you've done all those things, I, I want to give you an encouraging word today. Once you've answered these questions, this is important, then dear God, make a decision and trust God in it. You know what I'm saying? Some of you are so paralyzed. I don't want to miss God. don't want to miss God. don't want to miss God. You can't live your life that way. It, here. I believe, you've heard me say this. I've said it to you in counseling. If you've been to any time with me, I'll tell you this over and over again. If you keep your heart after God, you will end up in the middle of God's will and wonder how you got there. Because you think it all has to do with you. You think your decisions are deciding factors. They are a factor. But let me tell you, God's making moves you know nothing about. And sometimes he's positioning you in situations you know nothing about. I'm going to close with a story. A friend of mine, some of you will know his name, uh, Connie and I, you know, we've started a lot of businesses, uh, Napa Auto Parts, some of you here. We, we had a contract with them, and we delivered freight and even used people in the church to do it. It was great, wonderful provision. But one day I was out visiting with my pastor, and we were visiting somebody, and I looked over in the yard next door, and there was a big buffer out in the front yard. It said 300 bucks. I went, wow, buffer. I'm going to go over and talk to that guy. I said, hey. I see you got a buffer for sale for 300 bucks. Yeah, why are you selling it? Oh, I buff some of the quick shops in town. And said, so, oh, really? Yeah, I'm getting too old. Well, I said, well, if I buy your buffer, can I have those accounts? He said, well, it's up to them, but I'll, rec I'll put a good word in for you. I said, okay. I said, you got anything else for sale? Well, yeah, I got a shampooer, commercial shampooer. I said, what do you got that for? Well, I shampoo carpets in restaurants around Wichita. Really? You want to sell it? Yeah, another 300 bucks. Really? Yeah. Can I have the accounts? Well, well, okay. So I go home. Connie, we're in the cleaning business. <laughs> if she'd have known better, she said, did you ask the four questions yet? <laughs> I made the decision. Little did I know how important this would become. 
See, you make decisions, and you think you know. You don't know. You better trust God. Make your decision and trust God. Don't worry about missing it. Just trust God. Keep your heart after God. There was a gentleman in our church who wanted to be a Wichita police officer. He, that was his dream. And so it came time. His wife and, I, and he came into my office. We want to do this, but we're just not sure. We're just not sure. We're just, you know, it, I don't know. I don't know. I said, well, let's pray a prayer. Is it your desire? Yeah, it's my desire. Well, let's pray this prayer. If you're not supposed to do this, let's pray that God will make it impossible, close all the doors, and you won't have a chance. They went, let's pray. We prayed. Guess what? He got accepted into the academy. He spoke Spanish. They need Spanish-speaking officers, right? And so it was going great. It was doing good. We're thinking, well, this must be the will of God for him. And halfway through, they called him in the office one day and said, we're going to cut you loose. They don't have to have a reason. They just cut him loose. <laughs> oh, I crushed him. Came into my office in tears. He's mad at God. He's mad at everybody, you know. Oh, it must be racism. You know, that we default to that. Of course, oh, yeah, it's got to be a reason. Got to be a reason. I said, wait a minute. Don't you remember? We prayed. God has made it impossible. I guess you're right. We don't know why. Except this. Years later, this person, you know that stuff I bought in the front yard? Well, we started a business, New Life Floor and Carpet Care. And that man who wanted to be a police officer is now the owner of New Life Floor and Carpet Care. You'll find him in the yellow pages. Big business. We even cleaned MBPXL. Would never have happened. Now, you help me out. Connect the dots. If I had never bought the buffer, if I had never asked about the shampooer, and we didn't know how to buff a floor. The first time we buffed the floor, we broke things. You know, <laughs> this is a big buffer. I mean, you could put your kids on it and ride around. It was, it was horrible. And my wife kept questioning, why are we doing this? This is great. Shampooing, we, well, we better not tell that this is tape. Uh, but anyway, some things happened, needless to say, that made us question whether we made the right choice. Maybe we did. Maybe we didn't. All I know is how things turned out in the end. And to this day, that decision is still affecting. And why did God stop this and open this? I don't have a clue. That's why I make decisions. I ask my questions. I make my decisions. And I leave it in the hands of God. And I'm not afraid of missing it. I'm not. Let it go, folks. Let it go. Don't be afraid. Your God's bigger than that. His grace will cover any mess-ups you make. Because I can tell you right now, I've made some stupid decisions. Stop shaking your head like that. <laughs> Don't go like this. Go like this. <laughs> but you know what? God's covered me. Now, don't take it too far. You know, I can just do whatever I want. It won't matter. No, it, it, you'll reap what you sow, but God will be there to help you make the payment. Let me tell you, he'll do it. If, if, if you keep your heart after God. Will you do that? We're going to, what's your one thing today? Write it down. Put it on your paper. Take it home and spend time, spend time thinking about it. We're going to come to the table this morning. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, we keep talking about it. It's in the books for our graduates. Man, this is so true. Won't you just trust in the Lord with all your heart? Don't lean on your own understanding. Please don't. That, that doesn't mean you don't think. You just don't lean on it. Seek his will in all you do. Keep your heart after God. And he will show you which path to take. I want you to come to the table this morning with that spirit in your heart. And I don't know, maybe you're in an in-between place right now. Probably. If you're not in one, you will be. There will be times of waiting. But there's a reason for the waiting. God uses it in our life. Robert, can we go ahead and go to that next slide? But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles, and they shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. Hey, waiting's not so bad. 
if you're waiting on the Lord. Amen? You a good waiter? God's going to make you a great waiter. He's going to use it in your life, especially for the in-between places where we learn to trust him with all our hearts. We're going to come to the table this morning in that Holy Spirit. This is a table. I trust in the, in the work that Christ has done for me. I put my total confidence in it. Wow, this grace. I don't understand it. I don't understand his love for me. I don't, but I take it. I believe it. I embrace it. I'm going to walk in it. Amen. I'm going to trust him. That's faith obedience. I put my trust in him. And, I, and I'm going to wait on the Lord in my life, in my everyday affairs. And he's going to use that to do great things in my life. Are you ready? Who needs to be encouraged today? Father, as we prepare our hearts to come to this table, I pray that we can put our trust in you in a fresh new way especially for those who are in the in-between places, those who are waiting. And there's not much to see right now. In fact, it might look a little dark. Uh, it seems too quiet. There's, there's, we're looking for more direction. It's just not there. But Lord, we are your sons and daughters, just like the 120 that gathered in the upper room. We're just like them. And so, Lord, we wait. We wait. And we put our trust in you. Thank you, Father. We pray together. We gather together. We ask all the questions. We search your scripture. Our confidence is in you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. We invite you to come down the center aisle this morning. Make your way to the side tables. Take the cup and bread and return to your seat and we'll receive it together. God bless you as you come. All it said and done There is just one thing that matters Did I do my best to live for truth? Did I live my life for you? When it's all it said and done My treasures will mean nothing. Only what I've done for love's reward will stand the test of time. Lord, your mercy is so great that you look beyond us. Find purest gold in my replay, making sinners into saints. I will always sing your praise here on earth and ever after. For you've shown me heaven's my true home. It's all been said. Sometimes we, because we, we take communion every week and it may just become routine to you, but I hope not. I, I hope it. I, I personally believe that something happens when we partake of the cup and bread. I think Jesus' presence is with us. I think he longs to have it. And I believe it's very possible today as you take the cup of bread. I'm not talking mystical here, but I believe speak to you. I believe you can be healed. I believe God will give you direction. I believe he can fill you fresh with the Holy Spirit. One baptism, many fillings. Maybe you need to be filled today. Amen? Can, this, is, this, is, this is important. Here. It's also time to reflect on our lives. Are there things Paul said we need to take inventory? It's a good time to do that.
Maybe it's the obedience thing. Let God speak with you about that. Maybe it's valuing the gathering together, restoring that again and making it so important. Praying together, increasing our prayer life and and be able to trust God in the decisions we make. Maybe today you have a decision to make right now. Nobody knows about it. You're not sure what to do. Maybe right now God's going to speak to your heart. Would you just be open to that? Let's just allow him to do something special as we take the bread and cup. Father, we thank you. We thank you for what this represents to us. We believe you are present as we partake of the cup and bread. I pray you will, just right now, even though we're doing it corporately, you're speaking to us individually. Lord, let us, help us listen. Enlarge our hearts to receive it. In the precious name of Jesus. Thank you. are able. We're going to be dismissing. And uh, I don't know what your day looks like or what you got planned, but I just pray you just commit it to the Lord today. I know we got plans, things we're going to do, but I'm sure God's got some stuff he's going to sprinkle in there. Uh, Maybe this week, you're going to see a buffer in a yard somewhere. Please don't buy it because I told you this story, unless God tells you to. But you might have something similar to that happening. We had a speaker Saturday at breakfast. Guys, was that incredible? That was an amazing story we heard. He started out with this word. Can you believe God to do big things? The reason he doesn't do big things is we're not expecting it. We're we're making other options. He told us an incredible story of taking a little girl into their home. They already had five kids. Little girl, two years old, weighed what? What did you weigh? 15 pounds? Hardly nothing. Had tubes, feeding tubes. She was dying. And he said, Should I? Talk about a decision to make. Should I take this little girl into our home? How will we take care of her? What will we do? But God opened the door and he took this little girl and God gave him wisdom and different ways to respond to her and got her all off the tube. And then at the end, wasn't it great, guys? He shows a picture of her with the family. Just a regular young lady just smiling from ear to ear. I think, wow, you were a glove on God's hand. Man, what a decision. That had been a hard decision. What an incredible thing. The bottom line, God wants to do big things. He wants to do it through you. I'd like to challenge you. Believe for some big things today. Believe. I want to believe God for some big things in my life. And I want to make sure I'm not in the way of that. I'm, not, I'm going to believe it. Would you believe with me? Father, as we uh, leave this place, we're believing for big things. The disciples, they were believing for big things. They had no idea just how big, but it was going to be huge. And thank you, Lord. They had a part, but you had the bigger part. May we confess that today and put our total trust in you. Lord, the disciples were taking the decision out of their own hands. That's what they were doing. And we want to do that too, maybe in a different way, but we release and surrender all these things into your hands, to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. If you want to come for prayer, we're going to stay behind. Otherwise, go in God's love, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And next week, we're going to light the fuse, Acts 2, read ahead. I didn't put the verses because I have no idea how far we're going to go. But read the whole chapter and you'll be in good place. All right, God bless you and thank you for coming.